Come along, take a trip to the past. We've got places to explore. Come along, take a trip to the past to learn about things you never knew before. Field trips to yesterday. Field trips to yesterday. Field trips to yesterday. Come along, we're on our way. They sailed to the New World on the Mayflower. They landed at Plymouth Rock. They celebrated the first Thanksgiving. Those are the pictures we have in our minds when we hear the word pilgrim. But there's a lot more to know about the pilgrims than just a ship, a rock, and a holiday dinner. In this program, we'll visit a village that has been built to look just like the first pilgrim settlement. We'll talk to people there who dress and speak like the pilgrims did. They tell visitors about the lives of the pilgrims and the settlement they called Plymouth Plantation. Pilgrim is the name we use for the first group of people from Europe to establish a permanent settlement in New England. There were 102 people, including 30 children. They set sail from Plymouth, England in 1620 and stepped onto the shores of New England after a difficult voyage of 66 days. So why would they make such a long, dangerous trip? There were several reasons. Many of the pilgrims traveled to the New World for religious reasons. Well, some of my neighbors have come to New England for they are not permitted to practice their religion in England and first they lived in Holland and then came here to practice their religion and earn their livings as farmers. Well, my husband brought me here. We had gone into Holland to live for a few years uh, to join a congregation there that he uh, desired we should join. Indeed, in time I was brought into the congregation myself and saw that, as my husband said, we might come to a place where we could worship that was not foreign, that was English but where we might worship as we desired, which is impossible, unlawful in England. Uh, so my husband desired we should be amongst the first part of our congregation to come out here. I would have been content to wait until others came and uh, some way had been made here. It would not be so hard. But my husband desired we would come out at the beginning, and so we did. We have been here now. Uh, it will be seven years this winter. Other people in the group came to the New World in hopes of having land, money, and a better life. I came here not because of debt, but because I could not make a good living in England. And so I came here as a servant to another man, and I worked for him for a time in this country. And now that I am done working for him, I will be given land of my own and live here as a farmer. I came to the New World because I thought that I could prosper here. I had heard stories of the great wealth of the New World, and I thought, as I lived a poor life in London, I could come to this place and marry a man who owned land and prosper more better here than if I had stayed behind. In England, I found it very difficult to, uh, to keep a family. I have two girls uh, born to me in Cambridge, where I come from, and uh, the money that I was paid for the work when I had it hardly seemed able to keep to buy enough in the market for that week's work and to feed myself and to feed my children and if my family should grow I didn't expect that the the profit would grow so coming to New England there is there is the offer that if a man stays here for seven years he will be able to be to own land and if he owns land then he can feed a family he need not be paid by another man to make a living he can raise his own food my first question was how did the pilgrims get the money to come to the New World, since most of them were quite poor. The way it worked was they made an agreement with businessmen in England who furnished the money. In return, the settlers agreed to work for the company for seven years. This way, they would make profits for the company from fishing, trading, and farming. But as I'm sure you've read in your history books, the pilgrims didn't get to the Hudson River. And they ended up on Cape Cod instead 
on November 11th, 1620. But the ground was sandy and there wasn't enough fresh water. So they explored the area and found a better place in what is now Plymouth. They landed there on December 21st, 1620. The journey across the sea had been rough, but starting a new community would turn out to be even harder. In fact, there wasn't even a place for them to live, so they stayed in the Mayflower while they built shelter on land. They built their community on the site of an abandoned Pawtuxet Indian village. First, they built a common house, one that lots of people could live in. Then gradually, they built a home for each family. Remember, there weren't any stores around to buy the building materials they needed. So, what did they use? Uh, the greatest amount of, of the buildings here are framed out of, of oak, which we find great forced when we arrived in New England, quite to our amazement. But there's such a, a great supply of it. The frames is made of oak, uh, even the sides of the houses, as well as you see here, the... the um, the clapboards, the riven pieces of wood that cover the side, those are made of oak as well, or cedar if you have that, but whatever wood can be readily split down. The roofs, mostly what we've used is a, is a marsh grass, a rush or a reed that um, must be cut uh, as it stands tall and then dry before it's set on. Um, and besides that I suppose clay is used uh, mostly to um, to fill the, uh, fill the walls with. But it was already December and they were running out of food. Lots of people became sick and died. Only about half the people who had made it to the New World survived that first winter. But the pilgrims didn't give up. In the spring, everyone worked from morning till night. The Mayflower went back to England in April, but none of the pilgrims wanted to leave Plymouth. And the pilgrims were very lucky, too, because the local Indians, their neighbors, proved to be very important friends. At first, they met Samoset, a Native American from Monhegan Island. Samoset learned English from fishermen that he met off the coast of Maine. He introduced them to another Indian named Squanto. Squanto was a Pawtuxet Indian who had been captured and sent to Spain as a slave. He escaped, got to England, and returned home. During his adventures, he had also learned to speak English, so he was able to communicate with the pilgrims. Squanto taught the pilgrims how to plant corn and fertilize with fish. Another Native American the pilgrims were very glad to meet was Massasoit. He was the leader of the Wampanoag Indians. In order to keep peace with their neighbors, the pilgrims agreed on a peace treaty with the Massasoit. The Emperor hereabouts, Massasoit, sought out our men for alliance when he first came here, and that has proven to be our savings. Uh, truly, it has made his enemies our enemies, and thereby we've had some troubles over the years. But my husband says that without this alliance, we might have been in, entirely at sea here. Um, the Indians, some of them, have proven to be particular instruments to us, sent by God, I think, to teach us how to plant corn and uh, to teach us of the politics of other, other Indians, for they have politics, I think, more than we do in England. Using the raw materials found all around them, and with the help of the Wampanoags, the Pilgrim's Plymouth Plantation began to take shape. Life at the Plymouth Plantation in the 1600s was much different than our life is today. Everyone worked very hard just to survive, and there was always plenty of work to do. And everybody worked. Men, women, and kids, too. That the greatest amount of my time, and most of the men here in Plymouth, their work is spent in the fields farming. For raising crops, there isn't anywhere that we can purchase our, our food from. We must raise it ourselves. Um, also, a lot of us have uh, found ourselves fishermen here and that we shall go into the bay and we shall go north of here um, to catch the codfish, some of which we'll eat fresh and some of it which we'll salt and put away for the winter time or to the other seasons when it's less plentiful. There are some few men in the town who've brought trades quite useful to us. 
they are uh, men like carpenters in a shipwright. Even a man was sent here to make salt, though somewhat unsuccessfully. Um, these men were able to keep employed at their work constantly. Women worked just as hard as the men. They not only worked in the fields, they took care of their homes and children. Oh, well, my labor doth differ from season to season. I will rise up in the morning, feed my son. Well, I pray as soon as I wake. Um, take the bedding out to air if it be a fine day, start up the fire, fetch water. That is always the same. If it is in the spring of the year or the summer or in the early part of the autumn, I will see to the milking. Then in the morning or in the summer, perhaps to weed my garden before we break the fast. And well, we will say our prayer before breakfast and, and after. And that being a small meal, take if not so long. And then I will set about my labours for the day to grind grain, to have flour to bake to go to the bake oven to bake bread, and that can take much of the morning. If it is the summer, perhaps I will do laundry by the brook, and that can take all the day. And the, oh, the cold weather, when it is quite cold, we slaughter the swine. And that is another labor that will take all of, perhaps two or three days before it is done. But whatever the season, there is always the, the cookery and my son to care for, the floor to, sweep and, and the garden to be tended for in the spring and summer there is planting and weeding and harvesting and harvesting in the fall of the leaf and even in the winter I will sometimes turn over the beds if the ground be not frozen, and turn manure into the beds and at the end of the day there is milking again in the warmer weather and well, as the sun does set we are most off ready for our bed especially at harvest time, that is the busiest time of the year, winter the least busiest. I get more sewing done in the winter. Children work too. They were expected to do whatever they could to help, depending on their age and size. Well, a child should not be a burden to his parents. Uh, very small children cannot do much work and are often just about their mother's skirts. But by the time a child is seven or eight years old, they should be useful. A young boy at that time begins working with his father in the field. He will help with planting, maybe throwing stones at the crows sometimes, uh, help tending the corn, pulling up weeds, and help dig up shellfish by the shore or fetching water for his mother. And older children might watch over animals, keep them from straying, make certain they bring them all back in at night so the wolves won't get them. Girls will help their mothers. Uh, they will work in the gardens and help prepare the dinners and do the scullery work after dinner. But boys and girls both by that age, by seven or eight or nine years old, should be a good help to their parents and not a burden to them. Today, if you need clothes, you can head over to the mall. But it wasn't that easy at the Plymouth Plantation. Um. I do make some of my family's clothing, uh, some shoes and aprons and coifs, my baby's clothing. We get the cloth from England, though. Uh, the most part of what you see me wearing, my suit, my husband's suit, our hats, our shoes, our stockings, all the most part of those come out of England ready-made. My husband and I do have some tailor-made clothing, though, for my husband has returned to England twice uh, since we've come out here and thereby has been able to bring out clothing for us. Once the pilgrims learned about how to farm in the New World, they sent back to England for cows, pigs, and sheep. Ships sailed back and forth bringing supplies and new settlers. Then they returned to England with furs and lumber and other traded goods. We also wondered what the meals were like for the pilgrims. We eat thrice in a day, for we do break our fast in the morning and have our dinner at at midday, our noon meats, and supper in the even. Noon meats is our chiefest meal. And, well, it does differ with every season of the year, does our diet, though always Indian corn. Nearly always I will have a, a pudding of the coarse ground Indian corn that I will sit to the board. And for to break our fast, we might have just the Indian corn. 
though this time of year for our noon meats, perhaps a, oh, a boiled salad of uh, spinach as well, and uh, perhaps a fish, or fowl, wild fowl this time of year. And for sops, that is much like breakfast, just a small meal. Bread made of Indian corn we have as well, and only water. Children did not sit down to eat meals at the table. There were only a few chairs, and the parents used those. The children stood next to the table and served their parents as they ate. So if you were a kid living at the Plymouth Plantation in the 1600s, your life would be quite a bit different than it is today. You'd wear clothes your mom made, and you'd eat food you helped to grow yourself. But what about school? Do kids have to go to school? We have no school here, though there are many desirous of it. We have no means to keep a schoolmaster at present. There are sundry, though, who do take pains to teach their own children for to read. I myself cannot read, although my husband can. And if when our child is more older, my husband doth think he have the wits for it, he might teach Zachariah to read, perhaps. Many of my neighbours think the reading of scripture, of the Bible, is of great importance. I think that is the reason that so many here can read, for the reading of scripture. What about doctors? At the Plymouth Plantation, your mom was the person who had the cures. Any are ill, they will first go to the mistress of the house, a child to his mother, a servant to his mistress, a man to his wife, for every housewife should know the art of simpling, to take the herbs from her kitchen garden from behind her house, and to make an infusion or an ointment or a conserve, that will bring a better balance to the humours of the body and, and restore the health. There is certainly no physician here, a learned man who's gone to university. Physicians are found only in the cities, even in England. Life at Plymouth Plantation was very difficult, but sometimes there was time to have fun and play games. Till the play a great many games, depending upon their ages. For once a child gets to be about six or seven, they get some wit in their head then and some strength and are able to do more of labour and have something less time for sporting. Though still they will be able to uh, run races or uh, wrestle as boys will do, to pick up two sticks as if they were swords and have sword fights. Or a girl, she might have a little poppet that she has stitched, or her mother stitched for her, of cloth that does look like a little baby. Or, or knots and crosses, perhaps just drawn on the dirt, and one child will make of the crosses, and one child of the knots, to try to get free in a row. Um, oh, there's such a diversity of them. Another fun activity Pilgrim Kids did was blowing bubbles. Kids back then also liked jokes and riddles. You have to understand, that their sense of humor was a little different than ours. Here's an example. Here is a riddle that is pretty simple to think upon. What is higher than a house, but seemeth smaller than a mouse? It is up higher than the house, but seems to be smaller than a mouse. Mm, to be seen at night, I will say, and that should give the answer. For it is a star. That is the answer. Pilgrim set up a government for the new colony that guaranteed just and equal laws for all the settlers. It was called the Mayflower Compact. What kind of government did the Plymouth Plantation have? Well, here we have a, a civil body which is governed by a, a chief magistrate, a governor, that is selected from amongst the freemen of the town. In March we have a, a general court where the freemen choose who will be the governor. Our first governor was John Carver, and when he died, the freemen of the town made William Bradford the governor, and he has five men to assist him. Back in the 1600s, women weren't involved directly in the government, but women did voice their opinion through their husbands. 
And sometimes women have concerns for how things are governed. Um, For example, how the cattle are divided. It's women that keep cattle, women that make dairy work and make curds and cheese and milk cows. Uh, To my mind, that a cattle were divided was very well done. Before it was divided, many of us were not content. So it is to an advantage to us, and I think some of my friends besides me did press our husbands that the cattle might be divided in shares. It's to our advantage. I have no say in any general court or public meeting, but my husband doth know my opinion on matters that are of importance to my family. But a woman's role, her sphere is more her household. She should be more retiring and not be very forward or intermeddling with more public matters. Today, When people break the laws, they have to pay a fine or even go to jail. But back in the 1600s, they punished people who broke the law much differently. Well, we have had some crime here in this town, and depending on the crime, there are diverse punishments. Indeed, I must confess that I am a man here that have been punished in this town, not for stealing or anything, for men that have stolen have been whipped for it. But myself and another man were taken up for fighting with sword and dagger and indeed had wounded one another before we were stopped. And we were judged by the whole company that we should be tied neck to heels and to lay that way for 20 and four hours without food nor drink. Although indeed our pains were so great and we protested so much, and also our master, Stephen Hopkins, the man who hired us, did protest so much that we were released after only one hour of debt punishment. To protect the community, the Plymouth Plantation had a small army called A militia. We do have a militia or a a trained band here in the town. Every boy over the age of 16 and every man under the age of 60 is required to be in our militia. We are trained in use of musket and sword and we are divided into four squadrons. In all there are about 60 men and boys trained to defend this town. We also have walls around this town, a palisade we call it, and a fort at the top of the hill with six pieces of artillery to help defend this town. In all, we are a pretty well defended town. We've certainly learned a lot about life at the Plymouth Plantation. And I know what you're thinking, what about Thanksgiving? Well, it's important to know that the Pilgrims didn't actually call it Thanksgiving. Some historians think it was called a harvest home celebration, like in England. There have been some times when we have rested from our labor. I dare say one of the times was our first harvest. When we got our corn in, we celebrated that harvest by feasting with the Indians for three days. Some men went out shooting ducks and geese and other wild fowl, and they shot a a great number of them in a short while. And the Indians brought some deer, and we feasted with them for three days. The pilgrims didn't observe Christmas or any of the other holidays that we take for granted. The harvest celebration was the one that really mattered. Because then they knew they'd have food to get through the winter. There were good years and some bad years too. But more settlers arrived and gradually Plymouth grew and prospered. In 1691, it became part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Today, we can visit Plymouth Plantation and see how it all started. Come along, take a trip to the past. We've got places to explore. Come along, take a trip to the past to learn about things you never knew before. Field trips to yesterday. Field trips to yesterday. Field trips to yesterday. Come along.